I wanted to talk a bit about copyright and licensing. So uh, this is not going to be a course about the law, about licenses and so on. And I'm going to start, I'm going to start with this. <laughs> I am not a lawyer because I want to make it clear that the discussions that we're going to have in this class are not informed by me as a lawyer. I'm a software developer. And so I want to be really careful that <clears throat> issues of licensing, how things apply, how the law applies to closed source, open source, and so on, that's a really large topic, a complex topic. So what I want to do is I want to talk about some of the basics around this, and I will um, point you in the direction of other writing and people who are lawyers and who can talk to you about this in more detail. But let's have a let's have a brief discussion. So Last time we were uh, starting to look at copyright, I gave you some readings in a video to watch about how copyright in Canada works. So in that video, you know, in terms of how copyright works in Canada, if you create something, it is automatically copyright. So you don't have to do anything in order to make something copyright. You don't have to put copyright so-and-so at the bottom. You don't have to use the copyright symbol. Those are optional things you can do but everything that you create, you automatically own the copyright. So that copyright is literally the right to copy it. So you control who has the right to make use of this in other contexts. And so this copyright stays with you until 50 years after uh, the death of the author. So that's a long time, you know, for the entire, for your entire life, everything that you create as an individual is gonna be copyright to you. Now, if you work for a company and you have signed a piece of paper that says all work products that I make while I'm employed by company XYZ become the intellectual property and are copyright company XYZ, that's a different scenario. So there you have, uh, you've signed over your copyright to another, uh, another organization. But in general, if you make a piece of code, you you write something down, you write a book, you write a blog post, all of those things are copyright to you. So let's talk about what you can and can't do when you find a piece of code. So I actually brought a piece of code here. Uh, one of the projects that we're working on right now is trying to uh, find dead links in a file and report on them. And so one of the problems that we have is we have to be able to look for URLs inside of a text file. So this is a problem that lots of people have. So think about every program that has to go and find URLs in a file and somebody comes along and they, <clears throat> they solve this problem and they stick a piece of code like this up on the internet. So my question is, what am I allowed to do with this code? Can I take this code and because it's on the internet, because it's on something called github.com, can I copy and paste that and put it into my project? So I have lots of students who will hand in work and sometimes I will look at something and think I've seen this before and I'll Google it and sure enough, two students have copied the same piece of code from the internet and they've handed that in. So we would call that cheating or plagiarism. You know, they don't cite where it comes from. That's a big problem. So when we talk about something being on the web and copyright automatically, this code that we're looking at here is copyright. Even though it doesn't say it's copyright, it is automatically copyright to the author. So what are, what are my rights? If I am a person who comes upon this, sees it on the internet, it seems perfect, it solves my problem, am I allowed to use it? So I wanted to talk you through a number of different uh, licensing topics. And one of the things I'm gonna link you to is a site called chooseolicense.com. And the first question is, um, what if there's no license? So what are you allowed to do? Um, so as it says here, when you make a creative work, so that includes software, the code is under exclusive copyright by default. So every time you find anything on the web, whatever, wherever it is, it is automatically copyright, even if it doesn't say copyright so-and-so. So the next part is, unless you, the author, include a license that specifies otherwise, this is important, Nobody can copy, distribute, modify, or work without being at risk of, you know, various kinds of legal repercussions. So if you make something, it's protected. It's automatically protected. Intellectual property law, make sure of that. So one of the things that we can do is we can make it possible to 
uh, have other people use our code or make use of it, study it, um, to include it in their code, to redistribute it and so on. And in order to do that, we have to create a license. So let me take you back to this piece of code here that was thrown up on GitHub. This is a really, really valuable regular expression. It's not a lot of code. It's, this isn't a whole project, but it solves a problem that's very common. And so if you start scrolling down, this was posted in uh, 2010 and people start reading this code and they say, this is great. Um, what about making this addition? I tried your code and it fails on these cases. Could you fix these cases? This is great. I love your code, um, et cetera, et cetera. And people start to collaborate on this code. But remember, this code is still copyright to the owner. And so the conversation goes on and very quickly we get into this comment from 2013. So can you assign a license to this MIT or BSD and lots of other people, uh, plus one for the license, plus one for the license and on and on it goes. So eventually this code does get licensed. If you scroll all the way to the top, you'll see that there is a copyright notice and there is also a license. And we'll talk about this license to, you know, and today we're going to talk about some and we'll talk about licenses as we go forward. So this author has made sure that not only is the copyright clear, they still own the copyright, but they have spelled out exactly what the rights of an individual who comes upon this code on the web, what are you allowed to do and not do with it? What are the expectations that you can make of the author and what can't you expect? So the license is a way for the author to be able to share that exclusive right to copy with someone else so that they also have the ability to to work with it. Okay, so let's so our beginning point is you're not allowed to do anything with it. So let me ask you another question. What about Stack Overflow? Are you allowed to copy and paste code from Stack Overflow? I, I already know you've done it. I've done it. Like how many times have you Googled something and there's a answer, it's right there, it's on Stack Overflow and you think this is perfect, I'm just gonna copy and paste this, plop it in my code and I'm good to go. So what are the, what is the license of code that's on Stack Overflow? Well, it turns out that there is a license that's um, on Stack Overflow. So it says, as noted in the terms of service, all publicly accessible user contributions are licensed under this license, the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license. And so if you're interested in knowing about this license, you can go and you can read that license and it spells out what you are and aren't allowed to do. And so if you want to copy, if you want to use this and you aren't the copyright holder, then what you have to do is you have to adhere to the terms of that license. So licenses are not just something that we use in open source projects. Licenses are very, very common in closed source software or proprietary software. So I actually have a number of licenses that I thought I would take a look at with you today. How many licenses have you agreed to? You sort of cover your eyes and click agree on um, the thing that pops up and says, you know, our terms have changed. If you want to continue to use your Windows computer, if you want to continue to use your iPhone, if you want to continue to use this music service, click here, and then you have agreed to the end user license agreement. Uh, all right, well, I know that a lot of you are on Windows. Have you ever read the Windows license? So there is a license that you have agreed to when you um, make use of Windows. And it's quite long, not the longest by far, but if you start scrolling through it, there's lots and lots of things, lots of rules about what you are and aren't allowed to do uh, with this software. So I would encourage you to take a minute and read, read through this and see, uh, see what you have agreed to. Um, let's look through here. What are some interesting things that are, are in, uh, are in this agreement? So for example, installation and user rights, the software is licensed, not sold. So this is an interesting thing. You don't own this software. You have a license to use it and you have it under this particular agreement. Under this agreement, we grant you the right to what? To install and run how many? One instance of the software on your device, the licensed device, and it can only be used for one person at a time as long as you comply with all of the terms in um, the agreement. There are certain restrictions. So um, for example, this license does not give you the right and you may not do the following. 
So you can't use or virtualize features of the software separately. You can't publish, copy, rent, lease, or lend the software. So you can't lend your Windows 10 software to a friend. You can't rent it to somebody. These are things that are baked into the terms of the license. Microsoft agrees that you can use it on one device, that one person can use it, and this is what you have to do. You can't transfer the software. You can't work around limitations, so you can't hack it and change it. Um, you can't use this software as server software, so you can't run your business on it. For example, if you wanted to run a web server or something like that, the software agreement that you have expressly says you aren't allowed to do this. You can't reverse engineer it, decompile it, etc. cetera. Um, on and on it goes um, about different versions and how many devices you're allowed to connect and whether or not you're allowed to use it in a virtualized environment and so on. So this proprietary license is really interested in limiting the things that you are allowed to do. You can use this. This software is available for use and these are the restrictions. These are the conditions that you have to agree to in order to use, use this software. Information about privacy and data use, when you're allowed to transfer this or not, authorization and activation updates, whether or not you're allowed to turn on or off updates, etc., and warranty, what you can expect from Microsoft. So Microsoft holds the copyright. This license grants you the ability to do certain things under the terms and conditions of the license. I brought in another one, Spotify terms and conditions of use. Do you use Spotify for your music? Maybe you listen to uh, your music on a streaming service. Spotify is obviously a very popular one. Spotify's license agreement goes on and on, and it's very, um, well, it's quite long, um, but there's some interesting things in here. So if we look at the number eight, the rights that you grant to Spotify, in consideration for the rights granted to you, you grant us the right, one, to allow the Spotify service to use your processor, bandwidth, and storage hardware on your device. So that, all right, it's allowed to use your CPU, it's allowed to use memory. It doesn't go into a lot of detail about how it's gonna use it or what it's gonna do in the background. Number two, to, you agree to allow us to provide advertising and other information to you. Okay, I can understand that. Number three, to allow our business partners to do, this, to do the same. So that's an interesting aspect of the licensing agreement that you agree to with Spotify. You are not only agreeing to have Spotify uh, advertise to you, but also their business partners. Who are they? What are they doing with um, access to me? In any part of the Spotify service, the content you access, including its selection and placement, may be influenced by commercial considerations, including agreements with third parties. And it goes on and on until this last paragraph here. You grant Spotify an, a non-exclusive, transferable, sub-licensable, royalty-free, perpetual, or in jurisdictions where this is not permitted for a term equal to the duration of the agreement plus 20 years, irrevocable, fully paid, worldwide license to do what? To use, reproduce, make available to the public, publish, translate, modify, create derivative works from, and distribute any of your user content. That is an unbelievable statement. So when you sign up to this service, they are saying to you, we're going to allow you to stream this music and you're going to allow us for any, for how long? For the agreement plus 20 years. So even after 20 years afterwards, we still have the right. You can't, this can't be revoked. It's a worldwide license that allows us to perform, modify, create de derivative works from, distribute any user content that's been created through this, through this medium. So what you're seeing here is, you're seeing a, a license that's used in a, in a closed source environment that is trying to make sure that the creator, that the owner of the service retains as many rights as possible. There's a big division between you, the user, and me, the service provider, the owner of this. Um, it goes on and on to say what you are and are al allowed to do, whether you're allowed to copy music, rip things, reverse engineering, circumventing things, on and on and on, all these different things and lots of things that you aren't allowed to do. 
Um, you're not allowed to, the following is not permitted for any reason, copying, transferring, reverse engineering. You're not allowed to crawl the Spotify service, etc. So there's a lot that you can't do and there's a lot that Spotify can do. So what I don't wanna do here is my goal is not to try and uh, radicalize you or, or, in, or say that it's wrong to have these kinds of proprietary software agreements. I've, I've agreed to all kinds of things like this too. The whole world works this way, but it's interesting to read what you've signed, what, what the provider has access to versus what you have access to. Here's another one. Uh, maybe you have an, an Apple phone, an iPod. Um, you also have signed or agreed to the Apple software license agreement. And this thing goes into all kinds of restrictions about things that you can and can't do. I'm not gonna try and read all of them. It just goes on for pages and pages and pages. Lots of warranty and things. Some interesting things in here, like for example, um, you know, you can't, you can't use the Apple software and services in situations that it could lead to uh, death, personal injury, or, or severe physical or environmental damage, which includes, for example, operating nuclear facilities, uh, aircraft navigation or communica communication systems, air traffic control, life support, or weapon systems. So, I mean, these license agreements bury in them really, really interesting things. And you wonder, I wonder what the legal uh, reasons are for this. What happened that Apple felt that it need to specifically call out nuclear facilities, aircraft navigation or communication systems, etc. So these proprietary licenses are about maximizing the control of the creator, maintaining as many rights as possible, making sure to limit the exposure that the company has when they're trying to make it possible for us to, um, to work with the software. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to lay that against some of what open source is trying to achieve. And I'm going to be talking to you about open source um, licenses, and we're going to look at a number of different open source licenses. But I also wanted to come back to something that came up when we were looking at copyright. So the copyright system also has in it this idea that copyright ends, that there is a point at which, you know, we said 50 years, up to 50 years after the death of the author, this work is copyright. What happens after that point? Well, after that point, things go into what's called the public domain. And so they're in um, a new legal space. They're not, they're not owned by a copyright owner anymore, and you're free to do basically whatever you want with them. So for example, the works of Shakespeare are in the public domain. Lots and lots of things that, have, that were created long ago are no longer copyright by anyone. And so they're in the public domain. So I thought it might be interesting for you to see an example of a piece of software that exists in the public domain and how they function and what it has meant for them. So you may be aware of SQLite. SQLite is probably the most widely used database system in the world. And if you haven't heard of it by name, you've used it, you used it today. So SQLite is in every browser that you use. It's in uh, every operating system that you use. It's in your phone. It's in video games. It's in refrigerators. It's in Dropbox. Facebook uses it. Google uses it. Every, everybody uses it. SQLite is an embeddable SQL database. It's meant to be hosted inside of another program. So for example, in, you know, here I am in Chrome. Chrome allows each web page to have its own database through the IndexedDB um, API as part of HTML5. So every domain has its own uh, client-side database that you can access, and it's implemented in SQLite. So whenever somebody needs to bake a SQL engine directly into their application, they typically reach for SQLite, and there's a reason that they do it. SQLite is developed and released in the public domain. And it's, it's, I wanna, it's really interesting in the way that they have chosen to do what they've done. So let's just take a look at this. So all of the code and documentation in SQLite has been dedicated to the public domain by the authors. 
So we have a situation here where the code is normally copyright. So we said that regular copyright law applies. However, SQLite has taken this interesting step to say, I don't want my code to be copyright in the way that it normally would. I want to dedicate it into the public domain. I want it to be able to do as much good as possible or to be as available as possible. Another way of saying it is to not be encumbered by rules around copyright and licensing. So let's keep going here. All code authors and represent, representatives of the companies they work for have signed affidavit, affidavits dedicating their contributions to the public domain. And it goes on to say where those are stored. So here's an interesting, anyone is free to do what? To copy, modify, publish, use, compile, sell, or distribute the original code. And you can do it in source code form or you can do it as a binary. And you can do this for any purpose that you want, whether it's commercial or non-commercial and by any means. So this software has as few restrictions as possible. It is in the public domain. Anyone can do anything they want with it. They can take the code and they can sell it. So if you wanted to make a company that sold SQLite, you could. You could just take that code and do it. Would people buy it from you? You would have to find some way to create a service or a product that wrapped around it because anybody else can also go and get SQLite. So you having SQLite doesn't limit somebody else from having SQLite. It, it remains open and public for anyone to make use of. Um, let's look at some other interesting pieces of this. All of the deliverable code in SQLite has been written from scratch. No code has been taken from other projects or from the open internet. So when it says that no code has been taken from the open internet, this is a reference to what we were just talking about a minute ago. When you find a piece of code on the web like this, if I copied and pasted something that was copyright and I put that into SQLite, I'm gonna cause a big problem because I'm gonna introduce copyright material into something that's supposed to be in the public domain. SQLite is working hard to not have that happen. So it says, we are very careful about where we take code from. All of the code has been written from scratch. None of the code can be, you know, taken from the public internet. Every line of code can be tracked back to its original author and all of these authors have public domain dedications in the file. As, as a result, the SQL code base is clean and it is uncontaminated with licensed code from other projects. So this is a fascinating project because we have this SQL database engine. It is available for anyone to use. It's written from scratch and it's maintained that way. So all of the people who have contributed code or the companies that they work for, which we'll come back to, they have signed and said, I dedicate my copyright of the code that I've just written to the public domain because by default, any code you write is automatically copyright to you. The information goes on. SQLite is open source, meaning that you can make as many copies of it as you want to do whatever you want with those without limitation. However, SQLite is not open contribution. This is interesting. In order to keep SQLite in the public domain and ensure that the code does not become contaminated with proprietary or licensed content, including open source licensed content, the project does not accept patches from unknown persons. So you can't just fix a bug and give it to SQLite and then disappear. So that sounds great. Like what if some random person comes along and, and fixes something in SQLite? They do want that. However, they also are very, very careful about where the code comes from. You can't just contribute into this without going through the process of signing over your copyright. So you're gonna find that when you're working with lots of projects, there's gonna be differences in the way that they're gonna deal with copyright. Some projects are going to require you that before you can work on their code, you have to sign a document that says you are signing over your copyright to this project so they, they can be clear of it. Um, the very last line here at the bottom of the screen is also interesting. In order to keep SQLite completely free and unencumbered by copyright, the project does not accept patches. If you're not familiar with this idea of patches, it's sort of an old concept um, where when we have a, a change that we're making, we don't, if I wanted to fix a bug in SQLite, I could submit what's called a diff or it used to be known as a patch. 
And so it's almost like if you think about putting a patch on the knee of your jeans, if you had a hole and you wanted to cover those up. So if you'd like to make a suggested change and include a patch as a proof of concept, that would be great. However, please do not be offended if we rewrite your patch from scratch. So very, very interesting things going on here. So because of this project, has said, we are going to build a high quality SQL engine. We're going to put it out there and we're going to greatly, we're gonna be very careful about what we accept. We're gonna force everyone to give their copyright over to the public domain. We're gonna make sure that this uh, code is free and unencumbered by copyright. What happens? Well, it's interesting because as a result of the choices that SQLite has made, everybody uses it everybody uses it so you might say to yourself well why does adobe bother with it like why does photoshop use it why does Re acrobat reader use it why doesn't adobe just make their own like they have good engineers why don't they just build their own um their, their own database engine why is bosch using it um in automobiles why is dropbox using it like all of these companies have lots of money why is google using it google and facebook and apple they have you know, trillions of dollars. Why don't they just implement their own databases? It turns out that just like solving the problem of figuring out a regular expression for URLs, we all have similar problems in software. We all need to be able to make code that does certain things. And if somebody builds a high quality version of that, somebody can come along and solve a problem once, Instead of reinventing the wheel, instead of everybody implementing their own version of a SQLite database, it's better for us to do this. None of these companies are selling that database. The database is not their product. The database supports their product. So they're trying to sell you an iPhone, a car, um, photo editing software. They're not trying to sell you um, database features. This is just a feature that they need in their code. So if somebody's already written it and the code is of high quality and I can do whatever I want with it, that's a lot better than me having to put a team together, sit down for a year or many years and create this and then maintain this code. So another interesting thing happens. What do you think happens when all of these different companies, and by the way, this is a small number, like there's way more than this. What do you think happens when Mozilla and Microsoft and uh, Skype and all of these different companies put SQLite into their products? As each one of these companies takes the SQLite engine and puts it into their source code, they're going to find bugs. So somebody's going to run it in an environment that has not a lot of memory. They're going to put it on um, an embedded device, for example. Another company is going to put this in some, in some kind of a desktop application on Mac OS, and they're going to find some weird bug in the way that it works with Macs. Microsoft is going to put it inside of Windows, and they're going to find some weird interaction with the Windows APIs. And on and on it goes. So Google is going to find some security bug, and they're going to have to deal with this. So let's say that each one of these companies comes along and they use SQLite and they find this bug and they fix the bug, what are they gonna do with that? Well, they're going to want to contribute that back into what we call the upstream. So if you think of the SQLite project as, an up, as upstream feeding downstream to all these other projects, Google and Facebook and Dropbox, these are downstream users of an upstream project. So SQLite is maintaining this code. If Google finds a bug and they can get their fix, their patch merged into the upstream project, it means they don't have to maintain it anymore. Now, everybody benefits when Google or Facebook or Bentley or whoever it is, when they find and fix a bug in SQLite, the entire ecosystem of everyone who's using SQLite benefits because those bug fixes make it out into all of the other products. All of the downstreams are able to upgrade to the next version and it is also free, uh, freely available and they can do what they want in order to use it. So it's an interesting choice. If your goal is to make, um, if your goal is to make millions of dollars writing software, the SQLite model may not be for you. I'm not sure that um, SQLite is making, you know, its authors rich. However, I would, uh, what's gonna happen with this is you're gonna become, if you worked on a project like SQLite, 
you're going to be in demand at lots of other companies. You can take the knowledge that you have working on this product and you could go and work all over the place because so many different companies are invested in having um, a high quality engine that's available for them to do this. So that, that is SQLite and that is this interesting case of software that is in the public domain. You're not going to run into public domain software for the most part though. For the most part, you're going to run into um, proprietary software like Windows and you're going to run into open source software and that's what I want to I want to focus on you know for the last part of this talk. So one of the the things that we're looking at is the open source definition and we're talking about open source licenses and there's a whole bunch of open source licenses I'm going to talk about one of those licenses today. So uh, open source is a particular way of licensing software similar to what uh, proprietary software is trying to do in the same way that window Microsoft and Apple and Spotify are trying to spell out the terms under which you can share in this uh, in the right to copy the software what are you allowed to do and what aren't you allowed to do what is the liability that the company has etc open source is trying to solve the same problems open source does that using the language of of um, intellectual property law but it writes the licenses in a very interesting way so that rather than trying to limit what the user can do open source licenses are trying to ensure the rights of a user and the user all of the users as it goes down down uh, from one user to another so there's a number of key ideas in any one of these open source licenses. For a license to be open source, it needs to adhere to a certain to these certain principles that are laid out in the open source definition. So what are they? Um, it has to be free to redistribute it. So the license shall not restrict any party from selling or giving away the software as a component or an aggregate distribution, etc. So the license shall not require a royalty or other fee for such a sale. So you can't limit people from obtaining it. Um, you can't charge people a fee in order to get access to the source code, etc. It has to be something that is freely redistributable. The source code. So the program must include source code. Open source, that's not going to surprise you, that for something to be open source, the source code has to be available and it must allow distribution in source code form as well as compiled form. So I might be using a piece of software and I've compiled it into my program, but what open source says is that you have to also make it available as source code, not just as binary. You can't just say, here are the binaries you can down. The binaries are free, you can download them. That's not the same as open source. Where some form of product is not distributed with source code, there must be a well-publicized means of obtaining the source code for no more than a reasonable reproduction cost, preferably downloading via the internet. So if you buy a router or you buy a fridge or something like that or a, or a, a phone and the phone uses open source software in binary form, it's up to the person who is using that open source software so apple or the the fridge manufacturer or the automobile maker they have to somehow make it possible to get the source code through some well publicized means so when they sell you the product they don't necessarily have to give you the source code in paper form or on a, a usb key or something like that but they have to make it available so when you want to know you know which software is um which software is is being used in this, you have to be able to go and find that. It has to be clear. The source code must be the preferred form in which a programmer would modify the program. Delib deliberately obfuscating the source code is not allowed. So you can't, you know, put up some kind of, like it's code, but nobody, you know, it's, it's assembler or something like this. Like it has to be the form that your employees would have worked on when they were, when they were working with this. Number three, derived works. The license must allow modifications and derived works. So I must be able to take this source code that is freely distributed, and I need to be able to make changes to it. That's modifying it. And I also need to be able to derive new works from it. 
So I should be able to take this and this is what we mean by forking it. I'm gonna take something and I'm gonna derive a new work from it. It's gonna be the basis for the thing that I'm gonna make, but I'm allowed to take it and go off in a different direction from it. And must allow them to distribute that modified or derived work under the same terms as the original software. So I have to be able to obtain the software, make changes to it, redistribute it, but then retain the same license. So a real goal of the open source licenses is that we're trying to make sure that all along the chain, as everybody uses the software, these rights perpetuate all the way down to whatever user is eventually gonna receive it. Integrity of the author's source code. The licensed may restrict source code from being distributed in modified form only if the license allows the distribution of patch files with the source code for the purpose of modifying the program at build time. The license must explicitly permit distribution of software built from modified source code. So uh, a lot of times this is very common where people will distribute a set of changes. And so the license may be required the license may require derived works to carry a different name or version number from the original software. So this is dealing with people who want to um, have a patch set or some change set that they want to ship on top of a base piece of software. Number five, no discrimin against, discrimination against persons or groups. The license may not discriminate against any person or group of persons. So you can't have a piece of software and you say, I'm only going to allow these people to use it. So this could be any kind of discrimination. Open source doesn't have, doesn't have any way for you to do that. And so if you are saying this can only be used in this way, or these certain people can't, or this group, this organization is not allowed to use this, that isn't open source. And there's lots of controversy about that right now from certain people who wanna add uh, ethical type clauses to the open source licensing and so on. It's, a, it's an interesting discussion that's going on, but this is at the heart of open source that we shouldn't be saying who can and can't use things. No discrimination against fields of endeavor. So this is similar. The license must not restrict anyone from making use of the program in a specific field of endeavor. So you might not like that certain people are doing a particular kind of research or you don't like what their company is selling. But if I write software, I can't say, well, it's open source except for this type of research or this, this group. So you know this is interesting because it's trying to make it maximally available to, to different groups of people and different fields of investigation. Distribution of the license. The rights attached to the program must apply to all whom the program is redistributed without the need for execution of an additional license by those parties. So as the software gets added and included downstream, 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 the, the rights that the original author, the, the original user received from it, if I modify the original and ship a new product, it ha those same rights have to flow through me down to my users as well. So my users have to have the same rights that I had when I used the original. The license must not be specific to a product. The rights attached to the program must not depend on the programs being part of a particular software distribution. If the program is extracted from that distribution and used or distributed within the terms of the program's license, all parties to whom the program is redistributed should have the same rights as those who are granted in conjunction with the original software distribution. So here we were saying we could extract pieces. This is especially important for us as software developers where we wanna pull one file out or we wanna pull a module out or we wanna pull a library out of a larger piece. And so this is saying that the license is not specific to the whole, the license applies to all of those pieces. So if you extract a piece out of a, a, an open source project, which is very common, somebody has an algorithm that does what you want and you pull it out, the license uh, is still going to apply. The license must not restrict other software. The license must not place restrictions on other software that is distributed along with the licensed software. For example, the license must not insist that all other programs distributed on the same medium must be open source software. So can you mix open source and closed source software? Absolutely, you do it all the time. Your iPhone is a mix of open source and closed source software. Your Android phone is also a mix of open source and closed source software. In fact, every piece of software that you use, I guarantee you, is partly open source and partly closed source. 
because nobody today can build all of the software that we need. Everything is too complicated. Uh, take web browsers, for example. Google Chrome is not open source, but Chromium, the underlying open source engine, is open source. So you'll have mixes of proprietary and non-proprietary code. They have to be able to be combined together and distributed um, so that people aren't forced to say it's all or none. So open source isn't some kind of religion that I want you to get where you say, if it isn't open, it's bad, I won't use it. That's not, that's not how it works. At least that's not how I view it. I think that open source is trying to solve a lot of problems where there are lots of pieces of the software stack that we'd be better off sharing and not having everyone implement over and over again. Licenses must be technology neutral. No provision of the license may be predicated on the individual technology or style of interface. So for us as software developers, that's really good because we may want to take something out of one environment, rip it out of a particular operating system, or rip it out of something that it was bundled into a particular technology and use it in some new form. Okay, so these, these pieces of the open source definition, I want you to keep them in mind when we're looking at open source licenses. And they're gonna inform the ways that these licenses get evaluated. So when we say, is this an open source license? What we're really saying is, does the license meet this set of criteria? So I thought what we should do is take a look at a particular license. And um, here's one here. So this is a nice short license. This is the two clause BSD license. And just before I dive into it, let's look at some places where you're going to run into this license. So this is the source code for Chromium's V8 engine. So V8 is the JavaScript runtime that powers um, Chrome, but also Node.js and lots of other things. And inside here, there is a license file and the license file is this right here. So we're gonna talk, I won't read it here, but we'll come back to it. This is the license file for V8. Here is the Django project, really uh, famous Python project. And if you look in here, you can see that they also have this same license, which is governing their source code. I don't know if you've ever looked at D3. D3 is a really powerful uh, data for this system for building data-driven documents. You can build all kinds of visualizations for data with this, graphs, it's just, it's so powerful. If you're interested in data visualization, D3 is a really powerful piece of software for you to try using. If I go to the D3 GitHub repo, I can see on the right that they are using the BSD three clause license. I can either click here or I could also click on this license file. And when I do, I'm, you're gonna see that I have the license file available for me here. And you can see that GitHub has also added this banner to help me understand what am I allowed to do and not do when I'm looking at this. So let's take a look at this license. Let's understand how you would use it. So if you're creating a piece of software and you want to open source it, you want to take a piece of, so there isn't, there's no such thing as open source software or closed source software. There's open source licenses and closed source licenses. Software is just software. It's source code that we compile or we use in a particular environment. It has nothing to do with the law as it were. However, the ownership of that and the kinds of restrictions we add or remove from it, that's where we get into this idea of licensing. So when I want to take a piece of source code and I want to open source it, one of the things that I can do is I can add this license to it. So let's just read the license. So if you wanted to license this, what you would do is you would add a copyright statement at the top of your file, this license file. You would put the year in, you know, whatever the year is, and you would put in the name of the copyright holder. Copyright holder might be you. So if this is your own project, could be your employer, it could be a set of authors, a whole bunch of different people who are contributing. And what does it say? It says that redistribution and use in source or binary forms with or without modification are permitted provided the following conditions are met. You can redistribute this, you can use this, 
and you can do it in source form or binary form. You can do it with or without modifications. So this is answering a lot of the things that we just read in the open source definition. You're allowed to sell it, buy it. You're allowed to give it away for free. You're allowed to compile it and release it as a binary. You're allowed to use it in source code form. You're allowed to modify it and make derivative works. All of those kinds of things are baked into, these, into this first sentence. However, there are some conditions. You have to follow these conditions in order to meet the terms of the license. So what do you have to do? Number one, redistributions of source code must retain the above copyright notice and this list of conditions and the following disclaimer. So if you want to use a piece of code which is licensed under BSD, you have to make sure that you don't delete, you can't delete this license from the code. Why is this important? One of the things that open source is trying to do is it's trying to perpetuate the rights from one user to another user to another user. So if I take your source code and I modify it and I rip off this license header, and then I give it to my users, what I've done is I've broken the license agreement because my users, when they receive it, aren't gonna have the same set of rights that I had when I received it from you because I've removed, I've removed all of this licensing information. So you have to be very careful that you don't remove the license. Number two, redistributions in binary form must reproduce the above copyright notice this list of conditions and the following disclaimer in the documentation and or other materials provided with the distribution. So if you're going to sell a product, you're going to, um, you're making a video game and you're going to allow users to download this video game as a binary, you're not going to make the source code available because your product is not open source, but you're using open source. So what you're going to have to do in order to use this code under the terms of the license, you're gonna to have to include this license and all of these restrictions. It's gonna to have to be available in your documentation or it's gonna to have to be available somewhere in your product. Lots and lots of products, if you go digging through your phone or if you go digging through lots of different um, systems that you have, like, um, I don't know what it'll be, but let's say take phone as an example. If you go into you know, settings and about and, and so on, eventually in there somewhere, you're gonna find all of these software licenses because they have to include them somehow. It has to be on their website, it has to be in their documentation. So if you're going to redistribute this as source, then you have to retain this copyright notice and the conditions. If you're gonna do it in binary form, then you have to include it somehow in your documentation or in your website or whatever. Okay, so then you get to the angry lawyer part here, all caps, where they're yelling at you. And so these are the other things you have to know about. This software is provided by the copyright holders and contributors, in quotes, as is. So you are receiving a piece of code. Um, take the example of D3. So D3, here's all of the code. What expectations should I have of this code? What if this code has a bug in it? What if this code has a security problem in it? What if this code has some undocumented feature that I don't know about and it causes me problems? Well, that's on you. This code is being made available to you as is, and any express or implied warranties, and that it includes a whole bunch of different styles of uh, warranties, um, are basically are disclaimed. So you're, what, what it's saying is, here is a piece of code. You're allowed to redistribute it. You're allowed to read it. You're allowed to sell it. You're allowed to make derivative works. You can do all sorts of things with it. However, you have no warranty. So the copyright holders and the contributors to this project are not on the hook because you find a bug or because it doesn't have a feature or you think that, um, you know, it should do something that it doesn't do. So this is an important one for you because you're about to become one of the contributors. If you contribute to an open source project, this open source license is also going to protect you. The software is gonna be provided to other people. They're allowed to use it, they're allowed to redistribute it, but they can't come back at you and say, you, I'm gonna sue you because um, I, you know, this, this should have done something and it didn't. That's not, that's not what this is. 
In no event shall the copyright holder or contributors be liable for any direct, indirect, incidental, special, exemplary, or consequential damages. So, for example, including but not limited to procurement of substitute goods or services, loss of use, loss of data or profits or business interruption, however caused and on any theory of liability, whether in contract, strict liability or tort, on and on it goes, arising in any way out of the use of this software, even if advised of the possibility of such damage. So if you take my open source code, you put it into your product and it causes some bug which causes you to lose data in your database or causes your system to go down. You can't come back to me and say, we were down for seven days, we lost all this money, you're liable for this because you should have known that your, that your software had this bug. So what the open source license is trying to do is, it's trying to establish copyright. Who owns, who owns the software? Who is the creator and exclusive copyright holder of the software? It is trying to specify what you're allowed to do. Basically, you can do anything you want as long as you retain this license. So you can't take open source code and make it closed source. You can't take open source code and change its license and say, well, I don't really like this license. I'm gonna apply my own license. If you do that, you're breaking the terms of the license. If you're gonna put it out in binary form, you have to reproduce this copyright notice and all of the conditions. And you have to agree by using this by using this software, you have already agreed that you are using it as is, that there is no warranty express or implied and that there's no liability for the contributors and uh, copyright holders when they make use of this. Fascinating way of saying, we want this software to be out there. We want it to do as much good as, as it can, but we're also not providing you with a product. The fact that you're using it is up to you. You can use it. You are taking on any bugs that, that are caused by it. You're taking on any problems that it causes. It's not like you have paid a contract with a company and they're going to have a support agreement where within 24 hours, uh, a technician will get back to you and will start opening a case and fixing your bug and all of that. So you're going to see an interesting thing in open source, and that is that people are going to expect things of maintainers. They're gonna, they're gonna have expectations that um, a particular piece of software is going to continue to work forever. They're gonna expect that a feature that they want gets added. They're going to be upset when certain breaking changes happen and they have to modify their code. But open source doesn't make any of these guarantees. Open source just says, I am making it possible for you to take something that I wrote in good faith and allow you to do things with it, to make changes to it, to improve it, to include it in your product, to give it to your users, etc., and to give those users the same rights that were given to you. So if you go and you look at um, the license for D3, it's nice, this header is nice that GitHub applies because it, it helps you when you're going and looking at a license when you're when you're not when you're like me and you're not a lawyer it says BSD3 clause is um, a permissive license similar to the, actually I'll come back to the 3 clause part in a second so for just forget that part for one second but with a third clause um, that pro, uh, let's let's leave that for a second so permissions you can use it commercially you can modify it you can distribute it you can use it privately so that's what you can do. Limitations, you don't have uh, liability protection, you don't have warranty, and there are conditions that you have to meet. Um, let's just talk about this three clause license. So remember, how do, you, how do you use the BSD license in a project that you're gonna work on? Here you can see that Mike Bostock has put in the copyright information. So in 2010, right through to 2020, it's copyright to Mike Bostock. And then the license begins. So redistribution and use in source and binary forms of D3 with or without modification are permitted provided that the following conditions are met. So redistribution of source code must retain this copyright notice and the list of conditions. 
redistributions in binary form must produce the above copyright notice, the list of conditions, etc. And the third clause that has been added here, neither the name of the author nor the names of the contributors may be used to endorse or promote products derived from this soft software without specific prior written permission. If we go and look at Google's, here's Google's version of the same license. So I'll just make this a bit bigger. They also have this third clause. So it says, neither the name of Google Inc. nor the name of its contributors may be used to endorse or promote products derived from this software without specific written permission. So this third clause, what it does is it says, you can't use the V8 engine in your product and then claim that this is a Google sponsored project or that Google has blessed this product that you're selling and use Google's name in the advertising, or you can't use the name of Mike Bostock and say, D3 creator Mike Bostock has recommended that you use this because I've used D3 in my, my web app. That's, that's not what this is. So here we're adding an extra restriction that you can't, you have to get written permission before you can come along and say, I want to, um, I want to say that this project is affiliated in any way with it. So use of this doesn't doesn't connect you in any way back to the open source project. You're using it, but you don't you don't have rights uh, to do more than that. Okay, so we'll end where I began, and that is I am not a lawyer, and I don't want to pretend to be a lawyer with you and say, okay, well this is exactly what this means, or here's how I'm going to read this legally. If you're starting a company, you need a lawyer. Even if you're doing open source, you should really have someone who's guiding you and directing you on what you are and aren't allowed to do. But it's interesting for us when we're working with open source to understand that if you have no license on some piece of software, you really can't do anything with it. You can't copy and paste it. You can't download it and ship it in your code. The only thing you can do is you can ask the maintainers for a license. And if they don't give you one or they don't reply, then you're out of luck. You can't use it. If you're dealing with some kind of proprietary license, there's gonna be a lot of restrictions that you have to be aware of. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell you to eat your vegetables here and say you always have to read these things, because again, I'm not a I, I don't even understand what half of this stuff means either. Open source licenses are trying to implement these principles. They're trying to do something within the IP law, but they're trying to spin it on its head. They're trying to give people more rights rather than taking away rights. They're trying to make sure that the authors and the users of this, that we are able to continue that on down to future users of it. And licenses like the BSD license, the two clause or three clause BSD license are simple implementations of what we're talking about here. They're used by really big projects like Google to license their, their projects and make them as widely available as possible so people can do them. And when you are working on GitHub and you see a license that's licensed under the BSD, you'll know what that means. You'll know the kinds of things that you can and can't do when you're working on it. Okay, I'm gonna pause this there and I'll have some, um, I'll put these links up and I'll have some readings for you to look at. But, and we're gonna, come, we're gonna come back to other licenses, but I wanted to at least get us started thinking about how copyright extends into what we're talking about when we talk about open source.